Today we're going to uh, start looking at, at modeling, systems and software modeling. And, and uh, this will be give you a, a survey, more or less. So not too much details on specific models or so on. It's more just to, to uh, paint a picture of the general problem and uh, also uh, some of the answers to, to, to this, uh, uh, this problem. Uh, I'm going to start with some slides from the first lecture. Uh, what were the characteristics of, of systems and software design? Well, we're dealing with uh, complex systems. We saw combinations of uh, of uh, software and hardware, uh, intricate uh, collaboration patterns, uh, difficult to grasp for, for, or even impossible to grasp for, for a, a single human being. Uh, second characteristic was that it, it was invisible. By invisible, we, 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 we mean that it's, it's not a physical, physical, tangible thing, at least not all subsystems. You can, you can imagine that the, the hardware in, in your system, that's, that's a tangible thing. However, uh, the software, you can't really see that. So, so uh, these first two ones, they, they definitely make it difficult for us as, as uh, software developers or software designers to, to uh, uh, figure out what, well, we are doing because it's it's difficult to to uh, to to understand the whole system and it's also since it's impossible to 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 see it grow or see it emerge uh, a very well difficult challenge the second part here is that that this is a group activity and a group activity means that uh, well there are lots of people involved and lots of people involved means that we need to maintain uh, relationships to these people, communicate with them, and that also adds to the problem. So, so the root cause for, for, for the problems we, we, we enumerate here, the problem of, of uh, aligning work so that we work in, a, in one direction as a team, uh, the problem of, of, of uh, uh, having conformance when we have decomposed so that we're working on, on, on uh, different sub-problems in parallel, the root cause was, was communication. Communication among the members of the development team, communication among all stakeholders, all people with a stake in a project. And now, well, we can start to paint a picture here. What is the role of our software models then? Well, the software models, they are expected to, to, to bridge the gaps here, to, to uh, make it a little bit easier to communicate within the team, with external stakeholders and also over time because not all communication is face to face some communication is actually years in between someone prepares a document that someone reads a couple of years later so communication was the root cause here and you remember this process model that we, 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 we uh, outlined with the different people involved uh, in, in the process somehow. And what we can see here is that we have a couple of activities. We have a fairly large number of, of, of stakeholders and they perform activities to drive this project forward. Uh, towards a, a solution. Activities and roles 
were two of the process components. The third one, the work product. This is where we will find our models. Where we will find our models representing everything from uh, requirements, models that we use during analysis and design to understand a problem and to design a solution for that problem. We will use models in our implementations. And there will also be models that we use in testing. So the work products, the models here, will play an important role throughout the process. And the goal for today's lecture is that you guys should get a grip on or get a better understanding of what type of models do we have. Because what you will see is that there, there is a well, large spectrum of, of different types of models. Because a model communicating requirements to end users doesn't look the same, doesn't use the same language as a design model targeted for developers. So there are different models for different purposes for different audiences. So what is a the model then? Well, <clears throat> a model is a theoretical construct first. By that we mean it's, 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 not, a, it's not a real thing. It's a construct. It's, it's artificial. It's something that we have constructed. But it's a representation of some kind of process, physical, biological, or social. So, so a process, well, Remember the, the process model containing roles, containing activities, containing uh, work products. Well, that's the model of development processes. So that's a representation of how we work when we develop software. And that rep the representation here is, is defined by a set of variables and relationships in between these variables. So what is a variable? Well, for instance, the, the role here is an example of a variable. A work product is a variable. And then we can have a role responsible for a work product. That's an example of a relationship. So we can create models that represent biological, social processes, or physical processes. And the reason why we use models is because we have to enable reasoning. We must, well, since we are developing something, that we don't have. We must have something to, to, to well, consider before we build it. So, so we construct models of this thing we're about to build. Because when we have the models, we can start to reason about the thing we're about to build. You see, there is a hen and egg problem that we solve with the, the model here. Models are not perfect. They are not perfect. It's simplification. So the models simplifies reality. And that's, that's an inherent, inherent property. And the simplification here gives us an idealized model where we actually know that this model is not perfect, but it's good enough for us to enable reasoning about the thing we're about to build. So, uh,
I said that we will see several different types of models for different purposes, for different uh, uh, audiences. And there is a, a principle for uh, problem solving called stepwise refinement. A stepwise refinement is, is actually what we do uh, when we follow any uh, development process because we come up with some, some kind of rough uh, description of a problem and then we start to refine this problem description and then we start with a rough design for a solution and this solution is then improved, refined over time. So what stepwise refinement tells us is that the distance between uh, uh, the uh, problem and the implementation is just too big. We cannot take it in one step. That's not possible, at least not if it's a reasonable sized problem. There are of course examples where you guys can go from problem to implementation in one step, but that's not the type of problems we're considering here. So, what we're aiming for is, is something like this, where we step by step move from the problem closer to the implementation of a solution to the problem. But what does this mean in, to us in terms of models? Any suggestions? We need more than one model. We need more, more than one model. Yes. Because we need models to support each and every step. Okay? And the number of steps and, and the nature of each step is not defined on beforehand for a project. Because we all know that, that when we solve a problem, sometimes we find the problem very easy. We find a solution immediately. Do you recognize that situation? But sometimes it's a very tough problem. And a tough problem will require more steps, more models. So we will have models for the problem. We will have models for the implementation. For the implementation, it's easy to see, at least in this context, that, well, here you find programming language models and so on, so source code. But what could the models in between look like? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. So what is a good model then? What, is, what are the properties or characteristics for a good model? Well, a model should reduce complexity because the, the, the reason why we create a model is that we want to enable reasoning. And one of the things, well, we had on the first slide was this, uh, the problem's complexity, invisibility, etc. And, and a model can be used to reduce the complexity, focusing on, for instance, some aspect or s subset of uh, aspects that are part of the problem. Remo remove uncertainty means that it shouldn't introduce more uncertainty. Because when you start modeling, you have to make decisions. And you have to make these decisions, or you have to make assumptions. You have to make the assumptions explicit in your models. 
And by making them uh, uh, explicit, you know the decision, so you don't uh, have that uncertainty anymore. So if you look at models, uh, good models, they typically use the four properties or, or concepts at, at the end of the, uh, the slide here. So uh, a good model creates abstractions or introduces abstractions. So what is an abstraction? Well, we reduce information. We describe some entity with a reduced description. We remove information that is not relevant in a particular context. Modularity, what is that? Well, modularity is, is the fact that we can actually package parts of a system into a package where we just look at the outside and we don't have to understand the inside. What do you mean by that? Well, most systems that you use are defined with an interface that you use. So you don't care how your car works. You're just concerned with understanding its interface. You see? And it's the same mechanism you can use when you develop software. You don't understand how the database manager works. You just use it. You don't understand how the TCP IP stack works in all details. You just use it through the interface. So we can use this modularity to divide models up into to, to several models, smaller models, models that are easier to understand because they are smaller. We can also, when we have started to divide models up into to smaller models, we can start to organize them into hierarchies. And there are different types of hierarchies. We'll talk more about that, that later, but, but we can say that, okay, uh, one model may consist of several other models. That's a type of relationship that organizes uh, models into to, to an, an hierarchy. Information hiding is, is a, a very important principle uh, when it comes to, to uh, what is a hiding how the behavior provided by the interface is, is, is uh, realized by, by a uh, subsystem. And if you look at models today, they provide mechanisms to hide information. So the four here, the four items on the list here, they are actually just straightforward mechanisms to reduce complexity. Remove information, divide a large whole up into pieces, see how the pieces relate to each other, and hide information about how the pieces function on the inside. And the models we're going to look at in this class, they all support these some emphasize some of these more than others, but, but in principle, all models have some element of, of each of the four here. So, abstraction. There are some examples just to, to, to show you well, where you find abstractions in a programming language. 
So in what way is an, if you have an operation here, if you have a, if you have a method call, in what way is that an abstraction? Well, the method call, what you see is a signature. And that signature is a, more or less a return type, a name, and a, and a list of, of, of parameters. Okay? In order to, to use that method, you have to understand the signature. Okay? Not the implementation of the method. So that's an example of someone has created an abstraction throwing out information about how something is realized. You don't have to know that. So you can just focus on how to use it correctly. An object is also a simplification because objects Typically, at least some of the objects, represents real-world entities. However, these real-world entities have so many properties that it's, it's infeasible to, to, and not, well, they are not relevant for the problem either. So it's, it's, there is no good in, 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 in having, well, humongous objects that try to capture all properties for, for a real-world object. Instead, You provide a simplified description. The object is a simplification of the real world object, an abstraction. And in the object, we emphasize some details while we suppress others. The modularity. Well, we decompose our systems into parts. And again, I use, well, from Java, a programming language, uh, the example here is, is just that, OK, we can uh, divide our Java programs up into classes. A class is a logical construct. So we create a module that consists of state and behavior. The attributes, the, the state of the objects we want to create from this class, and the behavior, the methods that this object understands. Another example of, of uh, uh, modules in software development is the file. Files are central in organizing, when you're organizing huge development projects. But this is, this is more of a physical representation because it's actually something that we store uh, uh, in the operating system, using the operating system. Hierarchy, well, we can compose uh, subsystems into larger subsystems, or we can decompose systems into subsystems, creating a hierarchy. What you have here is, is it's a ranking or ordering of abstractions. But that is, a system consists of subsystems that consist of subsystems. That's an example of an, an, of an hierarchy. Encapsulation is, is uh, the activity that, that really, where you really try to, to, to uh, keep the innards of a subsystem hidden from the outside. Because if people know about how things work on the inside, 
they often try to use the fact that they know. And if people start to use a subsystem, not through its interface, but directly through its internals, well, we cannot change the internals anymore, at least not in an easy way. And this is why you have, uh, for instance, in, in, in Java, you have private protected access modifiers to, to, uh, uh, to, well, if you have a private property, for instance, a private attribute in an object, someone cannot access that directly. They have to go via one of these access methods. Okay, so, so like four good properties of models. And these four comes from, from the theory of complex systems. So if you want to describe a complex system, you better use these concepts because that's the best way we know to reduce the complexity of them. Still having something that enables reasoning. So, software models, or software dash models. So, here's a conjecture. All software systems contain models of the real world. All software systems contain models of the real world. What do you mean by that? Games. Start with this one. Can someone uh, think of a game and this game should have some model of the real world encoded within. Any ideas? What type of games do you play? Give me one. Uh, Battlefront. Battlefront. Okay, Battlefront. <laughs> so, what type of models of the real world do you have? Uh, physics. Physics. Game physics. What is the game physics? It's a yeah. representation of real world physics, but it's not perfect. So it's a model. model. Yeah, now we're getting somewhere. Physics, what else do we have? You actually have a, often in these uh, type of games, you have a very bad model of the human. Typically you can take too many hits, you can, and well, you get revitalized just by, by this. But it's, it's still a model of the human, human being in there. Not a very good one, but it's a model that fits the context. So, it's difficult to come up with any game, really, that hasn't or doesn't contain some model of the real world. You can think of that tonight when you go to bed. Control software. Control software, what is that? Well, say that you, uh, you run a paper mill. 
complex process. If you want to do it manually, it's quite a challenge because it's huge, spread over a huge well, geographical area. So uh, the poor operator, if we just go for one, has to run all over the place looking at uh, uh, gauges, uh, adjust uh, turn knobs and so on and so forth. So and instead, what do you do instead? Well, we develop control software. So now the operator can sit in a comfortable chair in front of a screen, monitor the process, and turn the knobs, the digital knobs, on the screen. But that type of software, of course, includes a model of the plant, model of the uh, valves, model of the sensors, models of, well, everything. Fly-by-wire, you know, Today's aircraft, they, it's not a mechanical system anymore. Instead, you have servos that control the movement of the movable parts of the aircraft. So, the software where you fly, that, well, that, where the, that the pilot interacts with when flying, of course, contains the model of the aircraft. There are even examples of, of aircraft that can't fly if it's not flown by software. They are unstable, so there must be software compensating, balancing the aircraft all the time. So actually, software is used to make a non-flyable aircraft flyable. Okay, so in the software, we find models of the real world. And you remember the first slide that had the problem on one side? and the implementation on the other side. Remember that? You know the big gap? Part of the problem description here for the game will be, well, the physics model. This should be the game physics for this game. Part of the implementation will be the implementation of this game physics. So what you can see here is that some models that we work with will try to capture the real world model that we want inside our software. And some models will be used to describe the internal representation of this real-world model in our software. When it comes to information systems, you know, uh, the student record system, for instance, that tracks all your studies, your grades. That includes the model of you. You didn't think of it, but it does. You are there, or at least an abstraction of you, with your name, social security number, address, courses you are admitted to, the courses you registered for, the grades from previous courses. That's you, the model of you. 
just to, to, to really make this clear once and for all. This is a word processor. What type of models of real world things do we find in a word processor application? Paper, yeah, definitely. We have a paper model here. And it's a configurable model, so we can, we can change the dimensions and, and so on. What else? The, you mean the, the, the characters? The, the, yeah, the typewriter, yeah. What else do we have? Yeah, often we have the, uh, a model of a dictionary in there, true. And we even have a model of the little guy proofreading your documents. So uh, there are a number of different models here that together make up the model of a word processor just to prove the point of the hierarchy here, that you can decompose the word processor. Well, we need a model for the, for the proofreader, the little guy that, that proofreads your documents. Or we need a, a model for the dictionary. So what, what, are, what, do you, what is included? in any of these models here? Well, it's two things. It's information, typically information about the state, the state of the paper, the state of the typewriter, the state of the typesetter. And it's also behavior. So information and behavior, that's what you find in, 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 in these models. So this leads us further down towards, well, models of software systems. And if you look at the software system, it's a combination of, in principle, three things information and computations on that information. However, we need something that controls the computations. Which computations should be performed? When should they be performed? How should they be performed? Etc. Etc. So we have control that controls the computations on information. So the system space here contains, well, control, information, and computation. And if you're going to describe a system, a software system, you need models that can vary the focus because sometimes you're only interested in the information included in the system. At other times you're only interested in the control and the computations in your system. Sometimes it's control, computations and information. So this is why we need something called views, different perspectives on the software system we're developing. And this is similar to the stepwise refinement where each step requires a slightly different perspective compared to the previous.
So the views here are required because, well, we have st different stakeholders, different interests, different perspectives, different level of details. The end user does not require to know everything about your system. The end user is not interested in how you achieve something. They're interested in what you will provide them with. They don't care about how. So in order to communicate with the end user, you need a model that focuses on what, not how. But for a, a uh, software tester, you must provide a model that describes both what and how. Just to show you the different stakeholders focus on different details. And that's why we need the views. The views are different models. So every piece of behavior in a system must be provided for in some sensible way. This is like the, the problem to implementation, stepwise refinement. And we must model the different aspects for whatever technology we have choose for our project. So what do you mean by that? Well, the models you choose also depend upon which technology you choose. So if you have chosen to implement in JavaScript, some models are much more useful for JavaScript development compared to uh, if you choose in Java. So depending upon which implementation technology you use, you will use a different set of models. So now we have stakeholders. Different stakeholders require different models. We have, well, the purpose, the, what we want to focus on, which specific details of the system, that require different models. And then the implementation technology will also require different type of models. So we have several different dimensions. And of course, if we want to choose the right models, we have to figure out these dimensions first so that we can select the most appropriate model for what we want to, to model and describe. So the problem in implementation here, let's look at models of the problem. Directed towards end users, okay, that's one example. One type of model. Directed towards developers, that's another type of model. Different properties. When it comes to uh, a model for end users, it should be, uh, you cannot have the steepest of learning curves for that model. It should be easy to understand. But if you target a development team, you can expect that these guys have at least seen models during the time at the university. So you can have slightly more complicated but more expressive models when communicating with the developers. When it comes to the implementation, well, that's where you feel a little bit more comfortable because you've been working with implementation in programming languages. These are models of implementation. But besides the, the, the application code, you have lots of other things that are models 
of your implementation. You have configuration languages. You have uh, languages that you use to, to uh, uh, program your database manager. You have uh, build and deployment scripts to make sure that the software is packaged in the right way and deploy deployed in the right way. What's important of, for the models of, of, of the implementations are that they, they should be pre precise because we want to use some automatic transformation tools here. Because we don't want to sit and translate Java to machine code by hand. That's why we use programming languages with formally specified syntax and semantics. Then we have all these models in between, while in transition from the problem to the implementation. And depending upon which purpose and which target group we have, you will see that there will be conceptual models, there will be physical models, there will be models that capture static properties of your system, and models that describe dynamic properties of your system. But that's something we talk more about in 10 minutes after the break, okay? Okay, so uh, we have different purposes for, for uh, our uh, models and, and uh, we have uh, static models that doesn't depict any change. Uh, we have dynamic that illustrates change, conceptual, which is a model which is primarily just concerned with reasoning and decision making. And then the physical one, which tries to model some physical entity. And, and physical models here in our world is uh, models, for instance, uh, that are very close to the implementation language, that, that describes how the implementation works. That's, that's considered a physical model. Conceptual versus physical. Uh, well, on the right hand side, we have a tomato, we have a knife, and we have a cutboard. Okay? These are physical entities. Uh, in order to start reasoning about these, uh, well, we cannot have a physical tomato, a physical knife, and a cutboard, uh, so we create concepts, conceptual models. One uh, that represents knife, or one that represents a cutboard, and one that represents a tomato. And remember when I said that the models we create, they are not perfect. They are simplifications. The simplification, because, well, we want to enable reasoning. We want, there's a purpose, and it's not to be perfect. Just to exemplify what I mean with an imperfect model, look at the source code. I guess that uh, it doesn't matter if you, if you, if you know, your, your, uh, know the programming language or not, but this is, this is the style of programming language models. Compare that to the real world. The cutboard put the tomato. What that illustrates is that, okay, we put a tomato on the cutboard, but in our simplified model, you actually get a feeling that, that, okay, the cutboard now has a tomato. That's not what it looks like in the real world, but it's a good enough simplification for our purpose. And now it becomes interesting because 
the knife here understands an instruction, a message called chop. But he doesn't know what to chop, so we must tell them what to chop. And we tell them to, to chop all the items on the cutboard. So you see the difference between, well, what it looks like in the real world and how crazy it looks in, 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 in the implementation language. And this is, this is well, what, what makes software development kind of tricky for, for beginners, that you have to shift your way of thinking a bit. In this case, you have to start to thinking about concepts like objects, objects that can receive and understand messages. And in response to these messages, they do things on other objects or on their self. Here we have an example of a, of a dynamic model. On the right hand side here we, we have a state machine. And this is a model of the state a tomato may take on in our simplified model of the real world. So at the top here we start with the first default state that we enter all tomatoes are, are, are whole. That's a good start. Okay? And then all tomato objects will understand three messages. So if we send the slice message to a tomato, it will no longer be a whole tomato, it will be a sliced tomato. And we can also send a quarter message and it will end up with a quartered tomato. Or chop. And we get a chopped tomato here. What else can we see from this model? Well, if we have slices or if we have quarters, we can actually chop them and we end up with a chopped tomato. So this is an example of an abstraction. We have simplified things a lot here. We have the tomato, but all the things we can do with the tomato are not interesting to us in this context for this problem. What's interesting, what we want to model is the fact that a tomato can be sliced, chopped or quartered. So we reduce the possible behaviors, reduce the possible states for a tomato into these states here. And what you see here is a model that is dynamic and depicts change. Down here we have some source code. And now you can start to see that, well, we start to use implementation specific models, impl uh, models specific for implementation technology. So our chop here, there isn't a single word about any tomatoes here. No, we can actually chop anything that is choppable. Now luckily it turns out that our tomatoes will be choppable because we will implement this iChoppable interface. Not more about that. So it's a a model that is, is getting far, further and further from 
the real world, but uh, still, the essence, the behavior we're looking for is there. So, a conceptual model that is static, if it combines conceptual and static, well, a concept primarily enabling reasoning, well, the knife here, the tomato, the cutboard, they will not change. It's more, well, what we have in our toolbox. We can uh, have knives, we can have cutboards, we can have tomatoes. And these concepts, the static ones, can be used, they are very good for, for capturing a problem, to describe a problem for, for, uh, uh, for potential users. Is this enough information about this knife, for instance, or do we need more information about it? Is the behavior for the knife enough, or do we need more behaviors? And of course, as you saw, we can use it to describe a solution. A concept here, a knife, is a, is a class in an object-oriented programming language. A class that you can use to instantiate objects. Objects here are more dynamic runtime entities that change. So the dynamic side is, is, okay, what do we do with these static entities? How do they collaborate? What do they do, they do together? How do they work together? And this can be used to show what happens in a problem and also what happens in a solution. What's important with the dynamic ones is that they typically depict that things change. What is things? So things in software is one thing, and that is state. Your software systems are huge state machines like this. And things you do when you compute is that you change the state of the application. To go from one state to the other. And that is what depicts change. Okay, so now we're getting into the not so philosophical side of things. We're going to get a much more practical in, in a couple of minutes. But first, just a few words about how do you model how do you describe models? Well, you can use natural language to create a model. What is the problem with natural language? Can't use it. No, you can't use it. Well, <laughs> natural language is much more than just, yeah? Can be ambiguous. ambiguous, or not can be, it is ambiguous. It's open for interpretation. You know, when, when we talk, we're using so much more than uh, we use so much more than just just the language. It's gestures, it's facial expression. So, so that's why you should try to avoid natural language because there are often many more interpretations than one. So instead, it's better if we start to, to, to use specific modeling languages. And the modeling languages, they are like on a, on a, on a range from, from very close to, to natural language all the way down to, 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 to formal languages, mathematically uh, founded languages, and everything in between. 
some languages are, are graphical. So we have a graphical, like what you saw for the state machine. That's a graphical language for state machines. You have states, you have transitions, you have uh, entry states and begin, uh, end states, and stuff like that. Because graphical languages are often better at capturing, well, more than, well, you, 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 you get the structure from the picture compared to, to uh, if you just have a flow of whatever notation you have. Formal models, they are precise. There's a mathematical foundation. The syntax is clear, the semantics are clear, and semantics, the meaning. If that's defined, we can avoid the ambiguities. There will be only one meaning with what we say with these models. So, programming languages, most of them have only one meaning when you write a statement. They are formal models. What you see in the background up here is, is an automata, a timed automata, a state machine. That's another example of a, of a formal language model. And you, can, you can use this to, to analyze your system, to verify that the system satisfies certain properties. But it's not very good for communicating with end users because they don't understand what this is. Just to illustrate the fact that different models for different purposes for different stakeholders. Okay, so when you talk about software modeling, uh, sooner or later you will end up with the unified modeling language the UML. And the UML is, is it's not a language really, it's a, it's a set of diagrams, set of languages, graphical languages, that you can use to express models for different stakeholders from requirements to understanding requirements to high-level design to detailed design to how your implementation is organized and deployed. So UML was uh, the result of, of uh, three guys that came together uh, back in the 1990s. Guys with a background in object-oriented modeling. So, so UML has a, a well been geared towards object-oriented design or object-oriented modeling. However, you can use it even if it's not well object-oriented technology that you use at the end of the day. You can use it for different purposes. It is independent of programming languages. So just because you use UML, you don't have to use a particular language. But still, the concepts are geared towards object orient or orientation, so it means that it's, you find better support for object-oriented programming languages than non-object-oriented programming languages. Uh, three guys coming together in the 1990s, well, the different models have different backgrounds. So, so they uh, borrowed from several others, uh, from uh, data modeling, entity relationship diagrams, uh, business modeling, component modeling, stuff like that, uh, and put this back together into a almost coherent package that they call UML. 
UML is now a, a standard by an industrial consortium. And it's always interesting when you start talking about uh, UML because uh, you often hear that no one is using UML. No one in industry is using UML. Uh, that's not true. But it's a big difference between what I teach and how people use it. When I teach, I have to tell you how it should be used. The details precisely describe all the concepts, all the ideas behind them, and so on and so forth. But then, if you go out and, and check what's done in industry, you will see that, yeah, like with any other language, like Swedish, you have one which is the written Swedish, and you have one which is the spoken Swedish. And those are slightly different languages. The spoken one is a little bit more sloppy, but, but you know, you understand what I say. But it's the same with modeling. If you just, well, need to, to present an idea to your colleagues in the team, you don't spend six hours in front of the computer drawing a perfect UML diagram. following the semantics and the syntax of UML to the point. No, it's the whiteboard, a marker, the not-so-perfect rectangles, the not-so-perfect arrows, the names and labels with spelling errors. That's how people use UML. But what's important when you talk about modeling is that we understand each other. And the benefit you get from UML is that in a couple of weeks there will be 30, 40 guys more in the world that at least have some understanding about what a class diagram in UML looks like. They will not be experts, but if the, a colleague of theirs starts drawing a class diagram on, on the whiteboard, they don't have to ask, what do you mean by that? What is that? You start to share a language, a design language, or a software modeling language. So, you're right. UML is not used like this in industry. But still, you have to understand learn the language before you can stop or use it in a bit more sloppy way. So, as I said before, UML can be used from, from the general initial design or initial requirements modeling to, to very detailed design. And you find support for UML in many IDEs. But, again, for me, modeling is a creative activity. And trust me when I say that if something kills creativity, it's computers. So it's impossible to sit in front of a screen with a pointing device trying to be creative. You have someone in your team constantly saying, hey, 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 wait, wait, I must update the drawing on the, on the screen here. No. Creativity, whiteboard, markers, interaction. So, don't, well, end up in this lock-in trying to dry, draw nice diagrams draw useful diagrams. That's more important. So if you look at UML, there are different types, similar to what we talked about before with conceptual and dynamic and physical and 
static, so on and so forth. Uh, they have a slightly different classification. Models focusing on functionality from a user's point of view, that's, that's one category. Then they have a number of diagrams focusing on the objects. Objects that make up our systems. And that can be like a state machine that describes the different states an object may take on to a communication diagram, which depicts how objects communicate, which messages are sent in between objects and when. But also, if you have an object-oriented language like, like, like Java or C++, the concept of classes, the static side of objects. You don't have that in all uh, uh, object-oriented programming languages or object-based programming languages, but, but it's there. It's the legacy. Then we have the dynamic ones that, uh, for instance, the sequence diagram is another one that uh, shows how messages are sent in a sequential manner. So we're going to look at some of these diagrams today, and it will be just like a, a quick overview, nothing more than that. But then we'll come back. So. Uh, Thursday, we'll talk about uh, diagrams that you can use to model requirements. After that, we will look more into diagrams that you can use to, to, to model a design. But we start with functional models. This is a use case diagram. Remember when I said that you, you, you have to define your model for your audience? shows use cases, actors, and their interrelationships. Okay, this is a diagram that depicts the high-level functions provided by a system. And since the system may have different users, well, we can have several of these guys. These guys are called actors, the stick man here. And what we can say here, see here, is that our system allows users to register users, to log on to the system, create a buddy list, and create a chat room. Three high-level functions. And you can take this diagram now, and you can show it to your grandmother, almost, and use it to explain to her what the system you're developing will provide her in terms of functionality. So functional view for the end user. No learning whatsoever. No complicated automata theory necessary to understand this. What the, was, there was one more aspect of, of, of well, because this will depicting the problem. But the other, the other perspective on this was, well, what if we want to communicate the requirements to the development team? Well, if I want to communicate to a development team what they should do, the requirements, the problem, I would use something more precise than this. Okay, so what is more precise than this? Well, as you will see in a while, there are a number of things. There are additional models that we can use to fill in the blanks here, to provide more details to the developers so that they can come up with a solution to the right problem. Here's another uh, example. This is a class diagram. Uh, you don't have to think about it uh, more than uh, what we have here are, are different classes. The rectangles here represent classes of objects. So in 
and this is a, a very close to the implementation, so it uses a, a uh, standard class in the Java library. But this shows for the developers, for the developers, what type of classes they have to implement, their classes relationship to other classes, to some extent which attributes and the type of these attributes. And you can also have the behavior, the methods down here. And if you don't have classes, you can, you can still benefit from a list of, of, of behaviors in your objects and, and, and the state of your objects. And you can use uh, a very similar uh, icon here to, to represent an object instead. And, and it's just like you underline the name here, and then it will represent an object instead. We will look more at this uh, next week. So, dynamic models, sequence diagrams, state charts, communication diagrams, activity diagrams. These are diagrams that depict things that happen. And some of these are useful when talking to, to, to end users, describing a little bit in more detail what happens. But some are very detailed and geared towards the developers. So this is a sequence diagram. This is a sequence diagram. Okay, so what is a sequence diagram? Well, at the top here, you have objects. And then you see how objects interact, sending messages to one another. So the outer box here, you can see where it says three times, that's a representation of an iteration, you know, a loop. So the information we get here is, is, is really that, okay, you have three attempts to log on to the system. And we start by looking up a user, and if there is no such user, well, we will abort this procedure. Otherwise, we can do a password check if we have a username that fits. And we can log on the system if the password log on to the system if the password is correct. So sequence diagram depicting how objects communicate. And what you can see here is that this is somewhere in between. It's not the implementation that we model, and it's not the problem that we model, it's somewhere in between. It's along the, the one of these uh, circles where we do the stepwise refinement. State chart, you have seen that. Uh, this is just to depict the states uh, a book in a library application can take on, a very overly simplified uh, state chart, but this is the entry state. Now the book is on the shelf, or it's borrowed, and then it's on loan, and then when it's returned, it's back on the shelf. You can definitely, without a doubt, imagine a couple of more states here. On the shelf, and there's a reservation. Uh, on loan, uh, pending reservation. Uh, when it's returned, it's being checked before it's back on the, 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 the shelf, etc.
Here's an alternative to the, to the sequence diagram. Here you can see objects sending messages to other objects. <coughs> Excuse me. So, when, when, is, when is a diagram like this useful? I often get this question. I would say that it's useful when someone finds it, it useful. Most people will say that all the information here is much easier to access from the code. Could be. But if you want to tell the new guy in your team how your code works, you can give the new guy the code and have him or her have a crack at it, trying to understand it, or you can give them some help and show them a, a simplification and an abstraction. So in our system we have these objects, you know, and we send these messages. It doesn't have to be perfect. As long as someone finds this useful, you can use it. Here we have the activity diagram. Uh, what this is, is this is an activity diagram for registering a user. You know when you, when you well, you register to, to uh, uh, some uh, uh, Say that this is uh, it can be a, a uh, uh, any type of of a web application really, you know where you have a please sign up uh, with a username and, and password and your email address, and then we confirm that you're actually you and not a robot trying to spam our forums or whatever it is. Uh, so the users must fill out a, a form first, okay? And then you check that form, that the information is, is, is uh, okay. So you have some validation activity. And this validation activity, either the information is okay or it's not. If it's not, you get some feedback and you can fix whatever is missing or if you uh, for, well, fill out a, a password that was, or a username that was already there or whatever it is. What happens next is that, well, the system sends out a confirmation email and then it waits for receiving a, a, a confirmation that, okay, this user was actually a real user and now he or she has, has confirmed the registration. So we have a question, what program do you use to make these diagrams? Well, I just told you, how, uh, well, the only reason why you should use a program is uh, actually to make PowerPoint presentations for students. Uh, uh, this is Visio, uh, Microsoft Visio. There are lots of freely available uh, tools for, for uh, uh, drawing UML diagrams. Visio is not one of them. Uh, I assume that uh, you can only afford it if the university pays for it. Uh, but after sending this confirmation email out, the system will wait. And then the user will eventually recognize that, hey, I got this confirmation email. So I go in and I confirm the registration. And that confirmation 
is received down here and the system then proceeds and creates or registers the new user. Or, you know, if you don't confirm within, what is it, two, three days, something like that, the pending reg registration will be deleted. So you cancel the registration. And this is illustrated by this. Uh, this is an hourglass. So it represents a, a timed event. So what you can see here is, is, a, is, a, is a nice little uh, diagram for discussing with your customer. Is this the way your customers should register to your website? Or do you prefer some other way? It's not a three-year university education required to understand this. It will take you, well, if you would explain it to your grandmother, maybe some more time, but, but uh, to someone who well, understands the, the type of application they are looking for, this is a pretty straightforward way of communicating with them. Okay, so there are lots of additional UML diagrams. And there are also, and you can see here, just to, from timing diagrams, very low level, to uh, deployment. How is your software system deployed on to hardware. You see it's, it's, it's high and it's low. It's conceptual, it's physical. It's static, it's dynamic. So you have it all in here. And if, well, some would say that isn't this enough? Now you have so many different types of diagrams. Well, turns out that no. <laughs> there are more diagrams than UML. There are some, some uh, inofficial UML diagrams. There are somewhere, uh, it's like flavors of UML diagrams. One which is, is, is I find the, these robustness diagrams, as they are called, they are extremely useful. I really like them a lot. Uh, at least when you work with interactive uh, applications that typically involve uh, end users on one end. Uh, you can use this to, to outline a solution, to do a first decomposition of your solution to a problem. What it is, is that it's in principle a simplified communication collaboration diagram. So, so we talk about objects that interact. But in this diagram, we have three types of objects. We have boundary objects. Boundary objects represents a system, an object on the fringe of a system. So an object responsible for interacting with the outside world. It could be a user interacting with the system, but it can also be another system. You see? Then we have the entity objects. What is an entity object? Well, an entity represents information in the system. And then we have the control. And control objects controls the flow of interactions between boundary objects and entity objects. So if you remember the, the, the pyramid where we have information, computation, and control, 
The entities represent the information. The control represents computation and coordination. Or, uh, and control, sorry. Uh, whereas the boundaries is just an abstraction to, to capture the fact that we are interacting with the external world. Here's an example. I give you fifteen seconds to digest. Okay, you remember the activity diagram. The activity diagram that, that depicted what happened on the user's side and what happened on the, the, the system side, okay? If we want to provide a solution to that problem, provide a system that behaves like that, well, we need some uh, boundary object that represents the interactions with the user when they register the information about themselves. Okay. So this is an abstraction. So in here you will find, well, the, the, the user interface So all the objects representing the user interface, all the event listeners that listens to whatever happens in, in the, uh, uh, when, when the user interacts with the in user interface, etc. So it's like a simplification. Then in the register user, here you will find something that ties the this is a control here. You can see that. It's a, like a, an arrow here. Because when you had fill out the form, there will be, sorry, that's, that should be a user, not an item. Sorry. Uh, so here, this should say user. Sorry for that mistake. Uh, so you create a, that's why you looked so lost. OK. So uh, this should be a user entity. And in here, you will have all the information concerning the newly created user. However, it wasn't a confirmed one, so it's just pending. So the register user control ends by, well, putting some information over to this control, confirm user registration down here. And that one uses another boundary object to send out this confirmation email. You can see that we use the external mail transfer protocol server for that. And then at some point the user picks up that email, comes into the confirmation page or whatever it is, to this boundary object here, here, and that completes the confirm user registration and we update the state of the pending user entity to a registered user entity. So an example of, 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 well, what you can express with a model. And, well, I could have told you this story in words, in natural language. But it would be tedious, error prone, ambiguous to come just 
present an idea to you guys. I think that our system should function like this. This is a perfect match. But it's not something that you can verify. That's not the purpose. It's not something that you can transform into a, a running system. That's not the purpose. This is a model that you can use to, to talk to an end user that, well, so it will work approximately like this. And you can use it internally to say, hey, guys, we're going to develop something like this. So uh, remember, we create models, and we create lots of models, but not behind a computer. We create the models on a whiteboard. The only models that we create in front of the computer is, is, is uh, well, the code. That will be difficult to do, do on a whiteboard. Different stakeholders that we target, different degrees of formality. The UML is one example of a comprehensive language for modeling software. Not the only one, and you are always welcome to add your own models. Models that you or your team find useful. Because that's the critical thing here. Usefulness. Okay, so next lecture, Thursday, we will focus on requirements and how to create models of the problem. So, thank you. See you Thursday.